Good evening, good evening. Okay, you can start the camera. Good evening, welcome to Shore Bible Church South, not just another church ministry. I'm Pastor Arthur Johnson. I want to thank you for joining us for another study in God's Word. Let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Uh, before we do, it's got a little technical difficulty we need to sort out here. Can you hear me? No? Testing, testing. Hear anything? Nothing? Testing. Testing, testing. You do. Which one? No. Okay, but you can hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now on the little black box to the right, turn the volume up a little. Testing, testing, testing. Can you hear me, Sister Brown? Sister Brown? Sister Brown? Yes, Lord. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I said, can you hear me through the speakers? Okay? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> All right. But let us bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne with grace with hearts of thanksgiving. Thanking you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanking you for the salvation we have through the shedding of his blood on Calvary's cross. We thank you for your word around which we gather to study. We pray for listening ears and believing hearts. And we pray when all is said and done, that it be to the glory and to the honor of your name and to our edification. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you okay back there? I can't hear you that well. Can't hear me that well. I have to press it again to hear. Just the volume up on your uh, no, on the uh, phone, the one that the, the ear plug jack that you got. In your ear, just to volume up. It should say phones. The volume. It's, it says no. Look down at the bottom. You see phones. Yes. Okay, so it's all the way up. And can you hear me? Okay. Hold on. Testing, testing. Just, you only need the one in your ear. Testing, testing. Thank you.
Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Don't hear me at all now. Okay, push that button back down again. The, the one I just... Now push the button that I just pushed. Push it back where it pops back up. Testing, testing, testing. Better. Huh? Better. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I was sounding out. Okay. Very low. All right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and proceed. Hopefully, it's recording. All right. Uh, we're continuing with our study on the. Uh, tripart nature of man and we've been talking about true spirituality in that regard and tonight uh, I'm going to begin by quoting a member of the Beatles John Lennon and this is what he had to say he says I believe in God but not as one thing, not as an old man in the sky. I believe that what people call God is something in all of us. I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right. It's just that the translations have gone wrong. And as we talk about true spirituality, and we're going to be talking about true spirituality and its measurement, how it is measured, um, the key to true spirituality and its measurement is the book, the Bible. And in that case, um, it extends to the translation but the book, not human viewpoint, is a measure of true spirituality. Your true spirituality is determined not by a supernatural experience, nor by how long you have been saved, but whether you are walking after the Spirit. I want you to take a look at Acts chapter 19. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not signs of true spirituality. That's the supernatural element that I was speaking about just a moment ago. Acts chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. 
And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now, let me point out something as before we continue to read this narrative. This is a passage that is often used to teach the necessity of being rebaptized. Assuming you got baptized under the wrong ministry they would see this as teaching the need or the fact of or the need of being rebaptized with water. But that is not what took place in this passage. There is no rebaptizing of these people that Paul met there in the upper coast of Ephesus. So let's continue to read, and, he's, and I want you to take particular note of how the, the text reads, and you can determine you can determine from the text that it is not Paul baptizing these disciples of John, but rather these disciples of John having already been baptized of John. Paul, subsequent to that, lays hands on them for them to receive the Holy Ghost. So in verse uh, 3, and he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? Now, it's interesting that he asked a question about them having, whether or not they had been baptized. Because in verse 2, he said unto them, have ye what? Received. Received the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Now, so Paul is associating receiving the Holy Ghost here with baptism but not with water baptism um, receiving the Holy Ghost he's referring to the baptism with the Holy Ghost John the Baptist said would be a part of of um, the men you know part of the ministry he had been proclaiming Matthew 3.11, for example, he says, I indeed baptize you with water, but there come one after me. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, the reason I'm talking about this last week or the week before, we pointed out the fact that um, the baptism of today, the baptism of by the Spirit into the body of Christ is not the same as the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Okay, there are two separate and distinct baptisms. But when Paul asked a question of them in verse 3, and he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And again, I point out, there's nothing in verse 2 that speaks of baptism in and of itself. But if you remember John's words in Matthew 3.11, when he says, I indeed baptize you with water, but there come one after me, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Remember in Acts 1.5, Jesus said to the disciples, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So Paul is asking whether or not they had received the baptism with the Holy Ghost. 
And so they, they reply, now, rather, let's uh, read verse 3 again. And he said unto them, unto them what were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Now that's the only baptism that they had, they had experienced. That they were, that they could testify to. Now what that means, now in Acts 19, you are far removed from Acts chapter 2. Now Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 is the day that they were baptized with the Holy Ghost and were filled uh, with the Spirit. And they spake in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? Let's finish reading. And, and then said Paul, and then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, many Bible preachers and teachers and commentaries in the words of John in verse 4, John's words do not end in verse 4. John's words continue, or rather the narrative, let me say it that way. The narrative, that is the timing, the context. The timing is contemporaneous with John the Baptist. That is verse 4 and verse 5 is contemporaneous with John the Baptist. Most people only see verse 4 as being contemporaneous with John the Baptist, and they see verse 5 as being contemporaneous with Paul being present there with those disciples and rebaptizing them in the name of Jesus. That's not the case. Verse 4 and 5 is contemporaneous of what happened with John's baptism. Then said Paul, again, verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, that is, the people John was preaching to, when those people heard what John had to say, they were baptized in the name of, of the Lord Jesus, okay? So now what does that teach you about John's baptism? John baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. A lot of people think John's baptism was something entirely separate from that formula there about being baptized in the name of Jesus. Um, again, you hear people talk about a Christian baptism to distinguish it from the baptism of John. But there is no such thing. Okay? But now, in verse 6, you know how you watch a movie on today? And they will either start uh, telling a story They have a contemporaneous moment. They will flash back to the past. And then they'll jump back to the contemporaneous moment and continue to tell the narrative. Okay? That's sort of like what you have here. Paul flashes back to the past, verse 4 and 5. Then verse 6 is returning back to the, you know, to the present time where Paul is present with those disciples and what he did at that time. Mm -hmm. But verse 4 and 5 is what happened in John the Baptist's time. Okay. 
So verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. Now, my point, and I, I, a couple more things to say about this in a moment. My, my basic point here is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not signs of true spirituality. Okay? Uh, most, many of people interpret, you know, having the spiritual gifts as a sign of spirituality. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. And I, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, but um, let me just make one other comment about, or at least make sure the picture is clear about what we just read in, in Acts chapter Acts chapter um, 19, make sure the picture is clear. John the Baptist preaches to people in his day. They believe and they get baptized in the name of Jesus. The baptism with the Holy Ghost is yet future. They don't get baptized with the Holy Ghost yet. When Jesus told his disciples they were to go and wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, they too had already been baptized, but had not yet been baptized with the Holy Ghost. So one can be baptized with water, but the subsequent baptism with the Holy Ghost can come later. Now the reason these people in Acts 19 had not received the baptism with the Holy Ghost, they weren't in Jerusalem on the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now, there's some interesting revelation in that fact because it proves and demonstrates that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was not universal. It was limited to being poured out in Jerusalem. If you were not, if you had been baptized by John, and many have, and were not present in Jerusalem on the day the Holy Spirit was poured out, and there were many apparently that were not present uh, in Jerusalem because, um, you know, Jews come to Jerusalem uh, at a time, they're, they're there three times out of the year by commandment. Um, But once the, they celebrated those three major feast days, the Jews who were not, um, uh, how would I say, residents of Jerusalem had to return back to their, their places of residence. Remember, the Jews had been scattered. They, they were not really um, allowed to all collectively uh, be present in Jerusalem, that is to, to maintain a, uh, a dwelling in Jerusalem. Um, so it would be possible, and it, not just, it was probable that there were many Jews who had um, partaken of the baptism of John had gone back to their places of residence such as these uh, 
ones here in Acts 19. And would not have been present for the when the Holy Spirit was poured out. That was a localized event. That was not a universal event. So Paul comes into contact with him. Uh, he, he, he learns that they are disciples of John. And as disciples of John, he wanted to know if they received the Holy Ghost. And again, these are people that go back before the day of Pentecost. Because it says they had not even heard whether or not there be. Uh, any holy guns. Okay. So they have been baptized. The only thing they needed was what? Not to be rebaptized with water, but simply to be baptized with the holy guns. And that was effected by Paul laying his hands upon them. Verse 6. And go back to Acts chapter 8. You see a very similar situation like that, where people have been baptized, and then the only thing required at that point was the receiving of the Holy Ghost. And that was accomplished by the laying on of hands. In Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 12, for when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, now what? When they were come down, prayed for them that they what? Might what? Receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Okay? Um, so the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not a sign of true spirituality. And by the way, when they received the Holy Spirit, the Spirit gave them, they spake in tongues as to what? The Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? Now again, many people interpret that as being spiritual, having, you know, spoken in tongues, or they had the requirement in order to be saved and, or to be an, a sign of your spirituality or a sign that you are saved, you have to speak in tongues. There are many charismatics or Pentecostals that would teach such, such a thing. They would teach you having to tarry for the Spirit. There's the second anointing, the second blessing, usually associated with, um, you know, uh, receiving the Holy Ghost. In other words, there are those who would acknowledge someone getting saved, but we still need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay. Now, but that would, you know, though they would be teaching that as a mark of spirituality. Okay. And what I'm su submitting to you is that 
true spirituality is not determined by a supernatural experience, such as speaking in tongues. Okay. Um, the gifts of the spirit, the spiritual gifts, number one, they were signs. Um, they were not marks of, again, spirituality, but rather evidence of the presence of God, God being with the situation, if I can say it that way. Um, Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 32. Now this may sound a little disjointed, but I hope what I've said thus far and what I'm about to say, put these ideas together for, for, for greater clarity on, on exactly what spirituality, true spirituality is. And it's not possessing spiritual gifts, okay? In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, well, let's start at verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged, on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is what? Also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that what? Obey him. Now go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Or verse 37 and verse uh, through 39. We'll go through 39. And when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. By the way, sometimes there's a hang-up about remission of sins and forgiveness of sins. We just read two passages that ought to clear that up. In the one we read about to give... Uh, in Acts 5 and 32 for to give repentance to Israel and what? And forgiveness of sins. In Acts 2.38 uh, men and brethren, what shall we do then? Uh, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for what? For the remission of sin. And what does that tell you? If you're talking about the remission of sins, what are you talking about? The forgiveness of sin. If you're talking about the forgiveness of sins, what are you talking about? The remission of sins. Okay. Uh, that's an aside. Um, but he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And thou shalt receive, what? The gift of the Holy Ghost. Again, what does Acts 5, 32 say? And we are his, I'm sorry, verse 31. No, verse 32, I was right. And we are his witness of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that, what? Obey him. Okay. What did they have to obey? The gospel of the kingdom. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and thou shalt receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
And the spirit is given to them that what? Obey him. Okay. But now, all of that is indicative or a sign to the nation of Israel about the visitation of God to that nation. Okay. Go to, go to Matthew, uh, Mark 16. Let me just uh, make the point again about, well, the fact that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a sign. Uh, Mark, six, Mark 16, uh, beginning at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Again, that will be the gospel of the kingdom. What does it say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sin. He that believeth and is what? Baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now watch. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall what? Speak with new tongues. But what does? how does he preface that? And these signs shall follow uh, them that believe. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22. Let's start at verse 21. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a son. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. But tongues are for a son. Being baptized with the Holy Ghost and signs following is a sign, but it is not a mark of true spirituality. Okay? Go to, well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're just going to start at verse 1, and I'm going to read down through um, verse 8. And what you're going to look for in this is the fact that the church of Corinth came behind in none of the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts, you might say function, operated at a maximum in the church at Corinth. Notwithstanding, they were the most carnal church established by Paul. Okay, let's watch. Verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, 
with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Now watch what he says in verse 5. That in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, that might be a throwback in terms of the idea in Mark 16 uh, and the Lord confirming the words with what? Signs following. Now that was true of the 12 apostles ministry, but that was also true of Paul's ministry. That the Lord validated, confirmed the message with what? Signs following. Now that's in the early days of the dispensation of grace. The fact that those things were present in the beginning of Paul's ministry is not evidence of or does not uh, teach that they continue throughout the dispensation of grace. We'll see that in a moment. But they were present and they were signs they were evidence of the message. They were they validated the message being preached, whether it was the twelve apostles or whether it was the apostle Paul. The Lord confirmed the word with signs following, and that was most certainly true of the church at Corinth. But those signs were not proof of their spirituality. Okay. Um, how far did I, did I finish reading? Seven. Verse 7 as well. So that you come behind you no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to jump down uh, to um, chapter 3. And let's begin at verse 1 and see what Paul has to say about these people who come behind him. None of the spiritual gifts. Okay. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as what? As spiritual. They had all these gifts of the Spirit, but Paul did not call them spiritual. Spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, are not a sign of true spirituality. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now, are ye able? For ye are what? Come. Yet come. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? But these are the same people who come behind in none of the gifts, none of the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts flourished in the Corinthian church. Now there's a reason for that. Go back to 1 Corinthians uh, 14. And what did verse 22 say again? Wherefore tongues are for what? A sign. To who? Not to them that believe, but to them that what? Believe not. But go back 
to verse um, verse eight again. Uh, no, make that verse verse twenty. Now notice what Paul says. Here. He says, "Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it? In malice be ye children, but in understanding be men." Now watch in the law. What did Romans three nineteen says? Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are what. Um, who is that? The Jews. the Jews. So in the law, it is written. So what Paul is about to say here pertains to who? The to the Jews. In the law, it is written with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto who? This people. Again, who is this people? The Jews, the Jews Israel. And yet for all that, will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are assigned not to them that believe, but to them that what? So, unbelieving Jews. It's a sign. You remember Jesus says the Jews require a sign. Ye will not believe without a sign. The spiritual gifts were signs, not a mark of spiritual maturity. Pursuing spiritual gifts today is fruitless, useless, futile, a waste of time. Because God withdrew or removed them. Okay. They weren't then, nor were they today. Nor can be today a sign of spirituality. Why? Because God has, God has removed them. I'm going to, my time is up, so I'm going to end this with, reading down through 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 through 13 and then we'll, we'll continue uh, this next week but look at 1 Corinthians 13 beginning at verse 8 and when he says charity never faileth but whether there be prophecies, he's talking about the gift of the, he's, he's, he's looking at charity. He's looking at faith, hope, and charity in contrast to the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. Charity never faileth. And by the way, faith, hope, and charity, charity, faith, hope, and charity, um, Faith, hope, and you know, faith, hope, and charity. Those are the marks of true spirituality. And they're contrasted with the spiritual gifts. And what does he have to say about it? The marks of true spirituality never fail. But whether there be spiritual gifts, such as prophecies, such as tongue, what does he say about those? They shall fail, they shall cease, all oh, this is in verse 8, they shall vanish away. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part, which are the spiritual gifts, I'm sorry, not the spiritual gifts, but when that which is in part, that is the revelation that God was given to Paul, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part, partial knowledge, partial prophecy, shall be what? Done away with. That is the gifts, which represents a partiality 
uh, something that functions and operates in an intermediate way. Okay. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I what? Put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. But that abiding trinity is the true marks of true spirituality and not possessing spiritual gifts. Um, now, like I said, we're going to finish this up next week, but let me just say one more thing here. Our text, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, for you know, looking at man's composition, true spirituality encompasses the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. Because what does Paul write there in 1 Thessalonians 5.23? That God would sanctify you wholly. And, uh, and you will see that that the basis of true spirituality is going to be the doctrine set forth in the Word of God, Romans 6, 7, and 8. So, um, John Lennon is grossly mistaken. But it, it's, it's, it's always fascinating to see men exalt their knowledge against the knowledge of God. Because I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right is just that the translations have got it wrong. Talking about the written word. Yeah. And it is the only way to know. Yeah. Okay. Faith cometh by here. Faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. So don't judge your spirituality by human viewpoint, but by the written word of God. It's the measure. It's the standard. All right. Um, coming up this month, the 18th of this month, this is our last quarterly Bible conference slash seminar. That will be December 18th, 2021, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. be here at 8450 South Ashland, Chicago, Illinois, here at the church. It will be streamed on Facebook uh, simultaneously. Um... Brother George has a Bible study every Saturday at 11 a.m., 1142 East 67th Street. And he would be excited to see you there if you live in the Chicago Lane area. Remember our sick and our shut in. Remember to pray for the ministry. Of Shore Bible Church South, pray for the saints of Shore Bible Church South, and for all those engaged in the work of the ministry, uh, according to the dispensation of the grace of God. Sunday services, nine forty-five Sunday school, eleven or ten forty-five morning service. 7 p.m. evening service, streamed live only on Facebook. Did I miss anything? Did I, anything I need to remember? All right, Brother Bobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's interesting.
<laughs> Seems like the more things change, the more they remain the same. And John Lennon, the thing that he denied is actually the truth. Because that's the other way around. The translation is the truth. The Bible yes. is the truth. And then the, the Corinthians, they thought they were all that. Mm -hmm. They had all of this, right? But they were actually carnal. Yeah. And even today, <laughs> people who say they speak in tongues, they think they're the spiritual. Right. They think they're all that. Yeah. And they're carnal. I mean, it's amazing. The more things change, the more they remain the same. God, and knowingly, how the body of Christ was going to be fractured and uh, immature. I mean, you had those books put in there. Yeah. yeah so, uh, but it, it, the important lesson, again, for us is not to confuse, mm -hmm. quote unquote, spiritual gifts yeah. with spirituality. Yes. Being truly spiritual. Same thing is the other way around. They see the gifts. They see the gifts from people. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, it says, but the but the Corinthians. It seems like wherever you saw water baptism and, and miracles, the, the Jew was somewhere. Yes. Around somewhere. Yes. Right. Even in the Corinthian assembly, they were right next. Right to next door. They, they shared a wall. Yeah. With the assembly. Jewish synagogue. Jewish synagogue right next door. And they were here. Yeah. And those sign gifts. Yeah. Is how. The synagogue lost their right, rabbi. Right, right. I think they lost two of them. They, they lost two of them. They lost two pastors. Two pastors. <laughs> two rabbis that came yeah. over and joined the Corinthian <laughs> church. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I suppose you did. Right. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for you being you, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for. The Apostle Paul, the administrator of the dispensation of grace, and if we understand the mystery, we will really rightly divide it so we can honor and worship you as the spirit of the truth. Thank you for the ministry here and the task for us and family. Continue to share with God your word, rightly divided, just let me dwell in any man with clarity to be able to share with others. Careful for his ministry and the members. And sick and shutting for the conference that's coming up, trusting that the two will bear fruit to the growth of individuals, to the salvation of individuals, to the spirit of Andrew. That again, you and you alone will be praised and um, glorified. And we are edified and we are rightly divided. We thank you for Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay. Okay.